obviously it's a big issue, and we thought, you know, maybe we should uh, make something about it to send, you know, our views, our messages, share our experience. And uh, over the course of uh, you know, several days, we all uh, made this. It's kind of like a documentary PSA type of thing. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Nice and loud. <laughs> Into making things better comes back to you in a good way. 
It's karma. Good karma. Treat people well or they'll treat you well. When you do good things, you get good things. Treat people bad and they will avoid you. Do bad things. Bad stuff happens. The badness will come back to you. When I used to bully, it was because I had problems with myself. But I took time to work on it. Now I have friends. Good friends. People actually care about me. Stop the hate. Stop the hate. Spend time making someone else's life better and the same will happen to you. Donate that nice. Eliminate the hate. Make it better, not worse. Be nicer, kind of. Eliminate the hate. <laughs> <Boom. laughs> That's the only thing. seating and moving forward, uh, but we will be having parts of the park, or the majority of the park, two-thirds of it open at all times for the public to use. Um, and then when one-third is done, we'll keep moving around so that by the end of the summer, we'll have transformed the entire park, including the um, Jungle Gym or Kids Play Area. We will be using the same um, flooring as we did at West Park, um, and we will be purchasing a new apparatus. Um, the apparatus that is currently there does not meet code. Um, and DSA, there's no way to put money into it and fix it enough to, to make it meet code, so we're just going to take the whole thing out and just replace it. Um, uh, but there will be no shade cover, it'll be completely outdoors. Uh, the, um, we're currently working uh, with the LCAP and everything that's going on with the LCAP and our LEA plan, we're currently working on a facilities plan, so as we are looking at the next five, six, seven years, we're looking at uh, capacity since we are growing the facilities plan, and and um, possibly looking at purchasing another piece of land for um, a third elementary school. The, uh, lastly, uh, Jim mentioned this, uh, pre-K. So uh, one of the things that we've been doing is we've been doing some groundwork of what will be needed in order to open pre-K classes. So this is going to involve obviously pulling utilities and doing some groundwork as well as foundation work. And so right now our uh, maintenance is working with Wally and Moody to um, come make sure that we have the right um, utilities and everything being able to be pulled and what the cost will be. So part of the uh, request or action request is, is to allow us to fund that research as well as fund the, um, the opportunity during uh, Kindergarten Roundup to announce the pre-K and see what type of response we have. So we'll know how many buildings we'll need to bring in. Right now, it'll be anywhere from four to eight buildings We'll be dropping on, uh, we'll be leasing these buildings, but we'll still need to pull all the electrical and everything to get it, get it up and going. And then there'll be new fencing as well as, um, you know, connecting it to the kindergarten areas of both, both schools. So um, that is something that uh, we're asking for later in the agenda. And that's it. Very well, Fortman, thank you for allowing me the time to be here to speak tonight. And I'm here to bring attention to the issue of bullying and the lack of safety for our children at our schools. The information I'm about to tell you was acquired from StopBullying.gov, excellent informative website on the issues of bullying. Between one and four, one in four and one in three in the U.S. students say they have been bullied at school. Most bullying happens in middle school. Bullying affects all youth, the bullied, the bully, and those who see bullying going on. Some effects may last into adulthood. Kids who are bullied can experience negative physical, school, and mental health issues. Kids who are bullied are more likely to experience depression and anxiety, increased feelings of sadness and loneliness, changes in sleep and eating patterns, and loss of interest in activities they used to enjoy. These issues may persist into adulthood, health complaints, decreased academic achievement, test scores, school participation. They are more likely to miss, skip, or drop out of school. In the 90s, 12 to 15 school shooting cases the shooters had a history of being bullied. Kids who bully others can also engage in violent and other risky behaviors in adulthood, such as alcohol and drug abuse in adolescence and adult. Get into fights, vandalize property, and drop out of school, engage in early, early sexual activity, have criminal convictions and traffic citations as adults, 
and be abusive toward their romantic partners, spouses, or children as adults. Bullying is not usually a simple interaction between the bully and the student who is bullied. Instead, it often involves groups of students who support each other in bullying other students. There is not a single profile of a young person involved in bullying. Youth who bully can, either, can be either well-connected socially or marginalized, and may be bullied by others as well. Similarly, those who are bullied sometimes bully others. Youth who bully, who both bully others and are bullied, are at greatest risk for subsequent behavioral, mental health, and academic problems. Prevention should involve the entire school, the community, the students, families, all staff, including bus drivers, nurses, cafeteria, and front office staff, in creating a culture of respect. Zero tolerance and expulsion are not effective approaches. Those are all facts that I gathered from that website. Bystanders who intervene on behalf of young people being bullied make a huge difference, and they should feel safe in doing so by means of a supportive school staff, more adult to student ratio, not just one security person for 600 plus students in the yard. That is by no means sufficient. More awareness of these facts needs to be made to everyone. Zero tolerance and expulsion are not effective approaches. Bullied and the bullies, bullies need counsel. These children deserve more than what they are getting. They deserve to be safe and feel safe. The world out there is hard enough as it is. School is a place for learning and growing responsible citizens. It should not be a place of fear, not a place to bully, nor a place to be bullied. I feel that we need more assistance in the staff for that reason. And as his video shows, it's a great idea. I think that it's something good, and I appreciate that, that you're starting with that. We need to go further, please. We need more people to help these kids. Thank you. A small delegation from Kern County Superintendent. We have 48 um, districts, um, including uh, the junior college. Uh, we have basically 48 uh, superintendents plus two um, chancellors. Um, I was invited to be one of six to go to Sacramento and talk to assembly members and uh, uh, Senate members about issues uh, that are near and dear to Kern County. Uh, some of the people that we talked to was um, Rick Simpson, Policy Director of the Office of Assembly Speaker, Nick Swicer, um, Policy Director for the Department of Finance, Assembly Member Rudy Salas, Assembly Member Joe Buchanan, um, uh, Senate and Assembly Member Caucuses from uh, uh, Roger um, McKenzie, uh, Cheryl Black, Robert Becker, Jennifer Louie. Um, that was just my first day. So uh, the um, we we talked about three main topics. Um, one is the LCFF plan, uh, making sure that there's continued funding, um, and also making sure that we uh, talk about our transportation costs. One of the things that is very near and dear to all of Kern County um, superintendents is. Um, our need to fully fund transportation. If you are not aware, transportation, uh, funding for transportation stopped in 1977. Uh, whatever we got paid in uh, 1977 was stopped until 1997. They gave us a one-time raise in 1997 and we have not had an increase since. Uh, there are districts that actually are old, that's, are getting paid 12% of what they spend on transportation. We are at 36%. So 36% were reimbursed from the, uh, from the state. The other part, uh, we have to come out of our general fund. So that was another main topic. Um, and also uh, to pay down our deferrals. So currently there are a lot of deferrals going on, which means that although we are teaching the children in this year, we don't get paid for those children until next year, which sometimes impacts our ability to buy equipment, uh, do certain programs, and right now we've asked them with the excess money that is coming in for uh, taxes to please um, get rid of all the get rid of all deferrals um, and catch us back up. So we're not actually borrowing funds to kind of keep things going. Um, it was um, very interesting, uh, and um, <coughs> I hope you never have it again. <laughs> so, that's it. I want to talk about our SELPA to start with. I have a brief description here of what a SELPA is responsible for and what it is. Basically, it's a consortium of districts that are represented under a county office. We're currently part of Kern County Consortium SELPA. They're the responsible providers for all special education services within our region. There's approximately 118 SELPAs in the state that consist of single district SELPAs and also multiple district SELPAs. Most commonly in SELPAs, 
contain and service up to two to 4,000 students. There are a very few amount of SELPAs, however, that do represent as many as 10,000 to 50,000 students. Ours currently has over 10,000 that they provide for. It's usually not recommended for them to be that big because they can't individualize services as well to separate districts. A SELPA must have an administrative unit, and the administrative unit is the legal entity that receives special education funds for the district. And oftentimes, this, the state will provide funding for the administrative unit for a SELPA. Major areas that are covered and required by the state and federal law for the SELPA is fall under a few categories. One is child fine, which is the responsibility to identify children with disabilities in the area. This is mostly done by posters and flyers that can be displayed throughout the community and at each school site. We are responsible for FAPE, which is to provide every student with a free and appropriate public education. LRE, which is the responsibility to educate each student in the least restrictive environment, which is spending as much time as possible and still gaining as much education as they can with their non-disabled peers. Due process, which involves mediation or administrative hearings and complaint procedures. IEPs, which are individualized educational plans developed specifically to meet a child's needs. And transition planning to assist students at a time of transition, which is typically like continued education after high school or getting them prepared for work. Specific SELPA responsibilities are numerous. I'm just going to read off a summary list. There's accountability, annual reviews of progress, uh, case misreporting, career training, community involvement and support, compliance reviews, coordination of resources among districts by regions, DRDP reporting, due process rights, educational benefit, full service to all students with disabilities, guaranteed equality of access, improved self-esteem for children with disabilities, increased parent participation, individualized education programs, less restrictive placements, local governance systems, program evaluations, quality program reviews, social acceptance of children with disabilities, staff development programs, state performance plan indicators, and transition from school to post-secondary education and employment. We currently address all of these areas independently. We receive minimal guidance by the SELPA, which we could get directly from the state. Um, my con major concern is that that is due to our geographic location. We have service providers that have to travel long distance to service our students, and it creates a dependability problem. We've had times where service providers haven't been able to make it here to provide the services that our students need. And this can be problematic for those children who aren't getting what they need, as well as the district who's paying for a service that sometimes they don't get. Advantages could be providing our own services to our students. It would obviously be beneficial to the student because we would have local service providers. So they would get their services that they need. If there was a service that was ever missed, it might be one service here or there that can be easily made up because the provider's local. Um, it's also beneficial to the district because we can contract directly with the provider instead of going through another agency, which means our costs would be far less. I've done the math, and it comes out to be anywhere from a third to a half of what we pay for our service providers that come from county now for us to hire them directly. We could receive direct funding. Currently, our funds go to the county, and we typically do not benefit from all the county programs. Basically, we could cut out the middleman. More funds would come directly to us, which could increase our programs that we can offer, increase our staff development opportunities. We have highly qualified personnel in Southern Kern, and we can't always utilize them because we are um, pushed to go through another agency. And also diagnostic, diagnostic center trainings. As I said, they provide a lot of trainings for school districts. However, 
due to our location, they won't come here. We're designated for the Fresno office. The Fresno office doesn't go beyond Bakersfield, so we can't utilize those trainings. However, we have a diagnostic center in LA that offers the same trainings, but they can't come here because we're not part of their SOPA. Uh, potentially, another plus could be that over time we could regionalize and accept other districts in our SELPA if they're interested in doing so, which could create a local support system here for us and once again increase our funding, which would open the door to a lot more programs. Currently we have all of the liability, but none of the funding and limited say on how the funding is spent. So. SKU USD is already held accountable to follow the state and federal laws pertaining to special education. Currently, some reports are submitted to the state directly, while others submitted to the county, who then submit them to the state. Therefore, ultimately, each district is monitored by the state whether or not they are part of a SOPA or their own SOPA. So before I go to the big question, does anybody have any questions to me up to this point? Hopefully we can keep all of our students in the district. If there's ever a student that we can't provide specific services for and we need to place elsewhere, it has been a problem for us because we're pushed to place them in Bakersfield. And if you're talking about a student with extreme emotional disturbance, to put them in a car and drive three hours a day is really not an option. So it is detrimental to the child because sometimes they don't get the service that they need and it's also an added expense or pressure on the district or a liability on the district because the student might not get what they need and if we do go to that extent then it's a, a huge expense. We can develop programs in the district as you know we're going we're developing an ED program right now so that we can service students in that category so with more funding coming directly to us as opposed to going through the county, we could develop more programs to service all the needs of all of our kids. Okay. And this might not be something that we can answer, but I would imagine if this we the vote on this goes through that we then need to increase more teachers, more special education teachers. Is that something that right now the only increase that we're going to have is for the two teachers for the E D program. Thank you. And then, and then this one, I don't know, maybe I should introduce this to Mr. Van Bushkirk or Mr. Weinstein, but when we do our new, uh, when we uh, start our new projects over the school, is there going to be, are they going to ramp up a, a bigger area, a larger area for um, Ms. Taylor for special ed? Yeah, we'll, we'll be obviously putting a lot more money, especially because we're receiving, right now we see, we receive, what, 500 and... Fifty thousand. We spend probably 1.2, 1.3 million dollars in special ed. One of the things is by cutting up the middle now. We the the county receives funding for all services, whether we use them or not. And we be giving those services directly, and then we can provide those services. If that means to expand areas of facilities or, or um, expanding the special education facility at the high school right now for the EB program, so it will at least give us a little bit more funding so we can do that. Whether it's hiring teachers because. Um, the number of students require us to hire teachers or one-on-ones or, -on -ones or whatever it takes. Uh, we want to be able to provide them with that, whatever, whatever it takes. And, um, and once we do become, we, we've already gotten permission to become a Lutzalpa. Now it's up to the board to, to authorize us to apply directly to the CDE to become our Lutzalpa. And we've already had indications from surrounding districts that uh, once we achieve that, uh, that next year they will be very interested in partnering with us and starting to send us, um, you know, their their kids, and that means that we'll be able to build them for it, because we'll be the the regional area, and then we'll be able to expand our program more, and our kids will help us because we'll be able to expand our program. Here was Mr. Blackburn, who teaches at Tropical Middle School. Eighth grade. Eighth grade, and what subjects? All subjects teach all subjects, who has presented tonight the Board of Education with an excellent video on bullying, hot topic. I'd like to ask him, how did it come out so good? Well, uh, 
There was a number of factors. Number one, all the equipment used was my own. I have a background in uh, video production. I have my own uh, editing systems and all that kind of thing. Uh, me and the kids from the beginning uh, wanted to make uh, a movie of some kind. Sure. Thought, all right, if we're going to do something, we want it to be meaningful. You know, we want it to really have an impact. And we thought, well, what's the issue that is on the tip of everybody's tongue? You know, what's the big deal? And sure. It's obviously bullying. Right. And uh, most, all of my kids have either been on the receiving end of it, uh, perpetrated in the past, reformed now. Sure. Goodness, sure. And. Uh, what we did is we conducted a bunch of interview segments. Uh, we had little vignettes where we reenacted uh, bullying situations, uh, examples of making things better. Some of them were, I mean, I wrote a script for it, but some of those were the kids' ideas, and I liked those because sure. they're more spontaneous. Absolutely. That, that was uh, a telling point about it. They seemed at ease and speaking uh, from their heart. Well, I also told them that I would never use anything that would make them look bad. All right. I told them, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to edit this myself, and I am not going to use anything that they wouldn't be comfortable with being shown. Sure. And the first people to see it were my kids, and I asked them, I said, are you comfortable with this? I mean, yeah. Everything that I showed in the video, uh, you know, we, we kind of proofed it before you saw it here. Right. And the kids had, you know, they were fine with everything. Good. Um, <laughs> Mr. Blackburn, you talked about uh, more yes. videos now. Is this first one kind of an inspiration? This first one, uh, we, we wanted to talk about obviously the, the, the topic in the room, you know, which is sure. bullying. Uh, each, there's going to be several more. Uh, as far as, as we're going now, there are two others that are completed. Uh, others will be doing in time. Uh, the ones that are completed, again, they're all themed. Uh, the, the others, uh, hopefully I'll have them done this weekend. One is about uh, you know, dealing with your problems as opposed to you know, pushing them off to the next day. Sure. Uh, it came out of a, a conversation I directly had with a student uh -huh. about there's only so much motivation a teacher can give. I mean, sure. A student has to give something back. Right. You know, it's about finding it within yourself to you know pick up carry on it's like the saying you know rocky balboa it's not how hard you hit it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward I mean, yeah 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 it was that kind of a the, the, the self-inspiration that we wanted to get across so that's the next one actually that was the first one we did this okay is the third one we did it oh the first okay one we got done and uh the second one was probably the most fun that's uh it's about uh math and it was uh, it came directly out of a conversation I had with a student. We were doing coordinate grid graphing, and yeah. the student basically says, "This is a waste of time. I'm never going to use this." And I said, uh, "Excuse me, are you going into the military?" "Yes." So I say to him, uh, "Have you ever heard of this thing called longitude and latitude?" And he says, uh, "Yeah. Why?" Uh, do you know about co coordinate graphing on points? Uh, have you ever heard of calling in air support? And so we were having this conversation, and then I just thought, well, what if we had this conversation? And this is sure. like a short film. But then you go and space out like you tend to do sometimes, and you're uh, fantasizing about being in the military. Right. And, you know, you need to call in uh, an evacuation, but you need to know your coordinates, yeah. and, you know, there's all this stuff going on around you. And, um, nobody knows what to do, and GPS isn't functioning, and so you know you pull out a map, pull out a grid, compass, find your position, and uh, so you know then you, you come back out of that fantasy and uh, you know basically understand what we had talked about. You know, math sure. actually can save your life. So sure. those are the other two uh, that are complete. Yeah. Beyond that, there are plans to do uh, like earthquake safety videos, ah. uh, more in the series of bullying, because obviously it's a topic where there's so many different directions you can go. Right. And I tried to touch on as much as we could. And I mean, the one that you saw was only seven minutes. Yeah. But, I mean, we tried to hit most of the important topics, especially now with all the technology that's being used in the school. Right. We have cyberbullying. That's a big deal now. That's right. As, actually, yeah. And uh, so we discussed that in the video. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that uh, I want to do. Uh, possibly for another one is kind of what I had in mind for a longer version of this video 
where we take uh, you know older people and we juxtapose and say like okay when I was in school bullying was not a thing you know it was just a way of life you go to school you get bullied that's just it yeah. nobody really made that big a deal about it nor talked about it the good news is is that now there is this awareness it is catching on people are more concerned about it now and you know by by that reckoning if you're aware of something you can change it sure so what we would say is all right you know i've dealt with it you know for other people it's it's cyclical you know what goes around comes around and the fact is, it's coming around now, and if we're aware of it, we can change it and break the cycle, as opposed to continuing it. So that's sure, sure. Where, that's where we'd like to head for the next installment of, uh, you know, we'll do another anti-bullying video. Sure, sure. Mr. Starkey, congratulations on your state job. Well, thank you. Would you explain... Uh, for my readers and viewers what the job is? Well, as a state representative for the CSBA, um, I'm a delegate for Region 12. Um, what I do is I tell us tell the state we, when we have our meetings, our delegate assembly meetings, in um, May and in December, we go to the state capitol, we talk about our issues for CSBA, we represent the main districts that we have, and then um, we just finalize our findings and we also um, do any policies that need to be re reviewed. Um, all, it's all for, about the kids. For the uninitiated, CSBA? California School Boards Association. All right. And so these are school board issues. Yes. Well, I brought up from the schools. Right. 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 And you discuss them and try to solve them and Absolutely. try to make them better? Absolutely. Try our best. Good. And you've done this before? Well, I, I'm currently, have been on for a couple of years. So right. This is my second term, so. Right. So you must... Uh, Thrive on it, or, or at least feel really comfortable like it. with it. Yeah, I really like um, representing all the kids in our district as well as our area, our region. Oh, that's so. great. Sure. Well, congratulations well, again, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.